call the meeting of the Deerfield Elementary School Committee to order at 5, 5.01 now. Uh, just to note, this meeting is being recorded and is being held in a hybrid manner. Uh, we're going to start by, oh, first of all, uh, welcome back everyone. I hope we all had great summers and uh, we haven't met since May, so it feels like it's been a while. Mm. Nice to be back. All right, we're going to first review and approve the minutes of May 16th, 2024. Make a motion to approve the minutes for May 16, 2024. Second. There's no, oh, there's two days. Um, there's no discussion. All in favor of approving the minutes? All in favor, thank you. All right, next up is the financial statement and warrants. Shelley? Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, there were 61 warrants signed since the last meeting in May. It covers a period of June 5th through September 25th, the warrant that's due coming up next. Um, those were signed electronically, totaling $909,460.06. Um, I'm going to go over account overages on the revolving fund. If I miss anything, or not on the revolving fund, I'm sorry, on the general fund and the school choice reports that I emailed out. If I miss anything, please feel free to ask. Um, these are actual overages that we will have to find savings from other accounts. It's not one of those ones that's false at this time of the year. Sometimes that happens with salaries, but everything that you're seeing in a negative account on the report currently is an actual budget overage for that line item. Not concerned about anything at this point in the year, and Deerfield in particular always has um, personnel changes throughout the year due to leaves of absence or unpaid time off that I'm positive will recoup the funds, but just to make you aware of the overages. Um, so under the, uh, on the first page, under the function code for business office, which I believe is 1410, you're going to see accounting software is over. Um, that is because we signed the contract for the renewal on our database for our bookkeeping and our payroll after budget was already approved. We never have those numbers. Um, I typically leave them stagnant and we just sort of make up those funds every year, but it was a pretty significant increase. That's a five-way split, so um, it is a big cost to the district and we are looking at how we can save money on that line. For example, we have some platforms that's offered with the software that we're not using, so we'll hopefully be able to recoup some credits for that this year and bring that account negative down. Um, District-wide technology, which is under the 1450 account, which I think is also on the bottom of page one, um, that account is over. I'm looking into that with our IT department and our curriculum. That covers some of the software that we use for educational purposes in the district. And there's some new accounts or, or new vendors this year, so I'm making sure that everything's in the right category. So that one could actually um, pan out. We do have some new printers in the building, so the copier line is over. Um, we started a new lease this year, and there's some different terms. Uh, this actually could end up being a savings for us because um, supplies and materials and labor, if there's a problem with any of the machines or if we need new ink or toner, is now included in the cost. Previously, we had to go to Staples or Amazon and buy those purchases separately. So it's a little hard to see right now if we're going to have cost savings because they were in two separate lines in prior years. But it's something that Scott Paul and I are keeping an eye on. He's our IT director um, just to make sure that we're not so far over budget. But we did expect that change after budget season when we signed the new lease for copiers. Teachers are a big one that's over right now. If you look at that line, um, there's a significant overage in one of those teacher accounts. I think it's under the early childhood. Um, that is because of the DEN program, but you will notice that the IA line is under significantly. So after budget was approved over the summer, um, Tina and Karen Ferrandino and Kim McCarthy, the special education and the early childhood directors, and Tina worked together to map out the staffing plan we decided that it would be best to go with two teachers in that classroom versus one teacher, and I think it was three IAs at the time. So we sort of swapped out salaries there. So that should be a wash in the end. Um, the teacher line might be slightly more of an overage than the IAs, but um, we'll be able to recoup those funds. But that's some background for you on the teacher line. 
The last two pieces are summer school stipends, um, which I believe is under function code 2440 on page four. Uh, that is an actual over battle line from the staff that we needed to fund or to fully staff our summer programs. And then the final one is uh, related to building insurance. This is something that the town back bills us. This is on page six of the report under um, non-employee insurance. Uh, their insurance rates went up, so we're seeing an increase in that line. This is typical. We don't usually have the rates during budget season, and we tend to have to make up those funds. Um, the growth this year was pretty significant. We're over almost $7,000, so that might be something we want to add a little bit of money to next year um, so that we're not trying to fill such a significant gap. Anything on general fund that I didn't touch on that you still have questions about before I talk about school choice? Okay, that was a lot of information and I know you just got the reports yesterday, so feel free if I went too quickly or if there's something I missed to email me, I'm happy to answer questions at any time. Um, the school choice item that I wanted to point out for you was in regards to the building uh, maintenance, what is it exactly? Extraordinary maintenance is what it is titled on the report. You'll see that that has, I'm sorry, building general repairs, one line up. Um, we have a budget of 88,000 there. That is to cover the overage, part of the overage for the front entryway project payable to Omasta Landscaping, as well as installation of mini splits with AMROG. We will see a rebate on those mini splits. Um, I don't have the exact amount in front of me, but we'll put that directly back into school choice. So the mini split total was 29,000 roughly. Um, so whatever we get back on that, we'll put back in to help replenish that fund. Um, so that was the update on that. Any questions there? Okay. Um, I'm going to talk quickly about revolving funds since we are reconciled with the town. Every year we go through this process of revol um, reconciling the town books compared to the school books because technically they are the town records, not our records. but town takes our data and inputs it into their system to make sure that everything comes out checks and balances. Sometimes we have corrections to make. Deerfield's really great. Their accountant is phenomenal and she's on top of it. So we're able to reconcile this early. So some of the other schools don't have revolving fund updates yet, but fortunately for Deerfield, we do. Um, I'm pleased to say that overall, we're in good shape with our revolving funds. Uh, I do have some concern going into next year, so it, it's super early to get into details, but things that we're watching, you can see school choice, even without the entryway project, we are exceeding revenues that are coming in. Um, and we did have this conversation during budget season that with our classrooms getting smaller, we have less room for school choice students. So we're gonna start to see this natural decline of our revolving fund balance in school choice. Based on the projections, we're still in a really good spot at almost 900,000. So, you know, we're not really concerned here yet, but it will only take a few years to eat up that significant balance if we continue to overspend at the rate we are. So, <coughs> excuse me, we should have more significant conversations during budget season about that revolving fund. Early childhood is pretty balanced. You can see the projections coming in are covering the expenses going out, it's almost a wash. Um, it's good to maintain that balance there in case we have any unforeseen expenditures come up throughout the year, it can happen. Uh, we may need you know, an IA un unbeknownst to us due to a student that has needs that we weren't anticipating. Um, same thing with special ed revolving and we have a new account for the DEN revolving program. Um, that is a new special education revolving fund while we could combine these, I felt like it was a good idea for us with a new program to keep them separate. Uh, we can have revolving funds for this purpose, so there's no negative ramification of setting up a separate account. And I think it gives us a good way to keep an eye on the health of that program financially as we're bringing in tuition and students. So in both the LEAP program, or what was referred to as LEAP, I'm not sure if they still call it, but at the school level, 
um, and the DEN program, we are bringing in a student from outside of the district in each of those programs this year. That's why there is revenue in those accounts. Um, the DEN program, we had talked about not doing that in year one. However, Tina, Kim, and Karen felt like the program was in a position where we could bring in another student given the existing students in the district. Uh, we didn't feel overloaded, so we have contracted with another town to bring in a student into that program. And you can see in both of those funds, revenue is higher than expenses, so we have good balances there. This is really important for these two funds because anything can happen um, at any point with specialized program when you're providing higher level of services to students with needs. So we're in a good spot there as well. And then finally, let's look at school lunch. You can see school lunch, it's self-explanatory. We've done an excellent job of reserving funds from prior years due to the full reimbursement of breakfast and lunch program and savings during COVID. Uh, we are gonna have to start to spend those funds down. Deerfield was picked this year for a procurement review by DESE. So they will look at the school lunch program, all of our revenue coming in and our expenses going out as well as our balance. This is a much higher balance than we would normally ever carry in the school lunch program. So Patrick McCarthy, our food service director, is currently doing an inventory at all schools of equipment and supplies and materials to see what new purchases or old equipment we can swap out so that we can spend some of this down. You're technically only supposed to keep three months of reserves as a balance in this fund, so we will have to make some adjustments, but right now we're in a really good spot with that. I just, I threw a lot of information at you really quickly, so please let me know if you have questions. If not, Carrie, I don't have anything further. Okay. Uh, I just wanna say that I think keeping the LEAF and DEN program separate financially does make sense. It will be good to see how, how that um, works. Um, and I think being able to take in a student in the first year is, is a great thing. I'm glad it felt like the program was in a good spot for that. There's no other comments or questions for Shelley. We'll move on to the principal's report. Sure, so we're off to a great start and um, want to thank everybody for their flexibility and patience as we navigated some active work sites our first uh, few weeks of school. Um, we, a big thank you to the police department too for helping us out, but all of the changes was worth it. Our front entrance is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, we did try our best to um, keep the school, first day of school fun. Um, and we squished ourselves over by the cafeteria, but tomorrow we're going to have a little bit of a redo. So hope you guys can all join us for our front entrance grand opening. I know that Darius invited you. I also don't know who decided to give kids donuts before they walked into school, but that was me and I'll have to figure that out tomorrow. Um, we are embracing the theme of you um, belong here. So I kind of organized my report around that. That's our theme for the school year. Um, I did list out the new, stand, the new staff who are right where they belong. And I wanted to share some of our DEI committee updates. We're um, kicking off a year-long initiative about making sure that everyone is feeling welcome and through a, what we would call like a whole school book club. And um, the themes this year, we're gonna focus on identity, culture, community, justice, empathy, and activism. And it also brings in the diversity leadership team, which is fifth and sixth graders. Um, they'll be kicking off the um, book clubs at the all school meeting. So I did include some pictures of the books that we'll be reading as a school community. I also wanted to bring back our behavior and culture update because I know at the end of the year, we were talking about some of those universal social emotional supports and um, we've got them up and running. So tools are on all the kids' desks. Those are little pictures of what you would um, find. So the zones of regulation is on the left. That goes with some of our curriculum, our social emotional curriculum. And then students who are allowed to choose a mindfulness maze or something that helps them in particularly calm. So every student has those on their desks. And then another thing that we're working on uh, through the ILT is we're intentionally looking at increasing our opportunities for families to connect with us and through um, anecdotal uh, inf um, data and just talking with people and attendance data, it's really showing that families show up when their kids are also here. So we're looking at events for families and um, kids. So Arts Festival Day is gonna look a little different this year. We're gonna have an evening component for families and children to come in. Oh, we're looking at doing a series of family yoga sessions. 
Um, we're also doing an initiative that has families coming into the classroom. Uh, we're looking at least once a year and pushing for twice a year. And we're also working with UMass. So those are some of the new things that we're working on this year. Any questions? I have a question. Sure. This may not be well placed. But Great. Just, <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> but I love, so I just like, I love that there's this opportunities for families to come and connect with their kids. And as someone who had to miss curriculum night because I had to be home with my kids, you know, it got me really thinking about like privilege, you know, when someone doesn't have like a family member or can't go to fourth babysitter, is there something we can do maybe next year it's to like think about how we can like allow kids in the building and parents can go to the classroom? Very well placed question because after curriculum night, I was actually talking with staff and um, it's going to, we're going to be working on it as an ILT of how can we switch curriculum night and make it a little different. So very well placed question. Yes, you'll, you'll hear some updates. Thank you. A lot of great stuff going on. Thank you. Really cool. mm. Next up, we have public comment. Does anyone like to get comment? All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, moving on to new business. Update on the summer repairs and renovations projects. <clears throat> Share my screen here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I, uh, I put the other slideshow, and Mary's going to see it twice now, um, but I'm showing what, what's happening all throughout the district so people get a sense of um, a lot of schools are doing very similar things and get an idea of what schools are working on and then overall what um, you know, your central office is working on. And then we'll, we'll go through Deerfield, then I'll come back and talk about Deerfield a little bit in more detail um, about your capital projects here. All right, so um, we're going to start with Conway. They got a new video surveillance system. So basically on each one of these, you can see what, how much it costs and the funding source. So as well, just to kind of how different towns are getting their projects funded um, this year. Um, so they got, they got um, obviously a video surveillance system. Um, they got a new phone system. Um, yeah. And you can see there, again, town warrant funded. And I'm going to go quickly through the, the, everybody else and we'll slow down for you guys. Um, they are finished with their AC mini split. Um, all the classrooms have been done. We haven't done the, uh, they didn't do the gymnasium um, in larger space like that, but, um, so, but they have completed that. Deerfield, um, we'll have a longer conversation about this, but um, obviously the kickoff is tomorrow, but we'll talk a lot about the monies and ins and outs and have a special a separate slide to talk about that because a lot of things happen there. Um, your AC mini split, um, we were able to get to through two phases of that and through town warrant and school choice. We got a new phone system, um, replacing 55 phones. Mm -hmm. Again, through, uh, that was through budget funding. Um, with, with any year in school choice, we repaired the side entrance. That was kind of a Disaster as many if you picked up your child from over there was it dirt? Mm. It was, it was, there's it dirt and whatever and then um, the Able to have a curb there to stop cars from going too far over where the children were lining up um, Is going to increase uh, safety of that um, We also got an addition to your video surveillance um, system to greater coverage throughout the building and outdoors um, And we use Esther 3 money for that. It's actual footage. What's that? That's yeah. actual footage. Oh, actual. <laughs> it, it's, uh, yeah, everything turns to a cartoon that comes through. I don't know. Um, and we have new classroom flooring. As you can see, the students enjoying. Um, again, with any of your funds. Um, and again, we have nine more classrooms to go to complete the entire, as you know, we're doing three classrooms at a time so that we didn't use up all the K 
capital on just one project when we have many other things to address in the building. Frontier, Frontier got a, a phase one of, of a multiple um, four phase roof project um, for just under a half million um, and that was successful. Um, smaller stuff, they replaced some bleachers that were um, broken and need repair. They had their walk-in cooler because of um, delays in the order and it had to be done during out of school time. It was actually supposed to be done last summer, but they finally got it done this summer. Some painting that was high up, which is, <clears throat> again, sometimes when we have it should be, someone would say painting should be a maintenance thing, but because it uses, you have to use lift equipment, you gotta, you know, kind of get people to come in and do it during the times it what is. We actually came in under budget. It was budgeted at 13,000, um, but I threw that on there because people say, well, that should be part of maintenance, but it's, it's more than what our guys can do. And we have to you know, pay more for that. And they did some tree removal as well. Um, and uh, along the fence of the playing fields, along the fence near the, there, there were a bunch of dead trees from our parking lot here going into the track area that had died um, for various reasons. And then over parking lots and that kind of stuff. I, I think the, one of the more important things on there is that small things like this cost a lot of money, you know, um, to do tree removal around and that kind of property maintenance. Sunderland um, is in their first phase, they did nine classrooms. Um, uh, with town warrant and maintenance budget. They had to update just similar, same thing. You can see, kind of seen the pattern here as we kind of got the whole thing here. Um, they had to, to upgrade their um, electricity um, panels in order to handle the new AC units. And this is what Ben does when he said, show me pictures of students in the picture. Thank you in the closet. Um, they have rotting happening over the, on their rib band around the entire school. They took this project, they broke it over five years and um, last year the contractor couldn't get to it based on his own schedule so this year we did four and five together um, so that's now finished but um, you know, side jab that's why you don't build a school out of wood um, they also had replaced windows they used ARPA money for that um, from the town um, it was rotting around the whole windows around the front end and the windows you know could no longer open and such um, this one turned into a small disaster because they found asbestos in the windows halfway through the project. I had to go back to the town and ask for money during the summer, um, and they were able to help us out there. Um, so with the asbestos abatement and such, it came out um, you know, about you know, $60,000, $70,000 over budget. Wheatley, they have to do electrical upgrades, um, and they put um, six classrooms of uh, mini splits. They only have to do two phases because they're a small school. So they're about half done. They use ARPA money. They also clean their duct system and replace the bathroom floor. Similar to how we did things here with our bathrooms, similar, same kind of idea. We do a few bathrooms at a time so that we can spread out these projects and get multiple things done through the years. And this is just a picture, cute picture of kids. This is just a maintenance budget doing carpet over. And um, through Town Warrant, they did three of their doors. Um, the bottoms were rusting out so bad that the holes in the rust critters could get through. So they had to uh, do three doors. And they're going to have to do a few more next year as well. Um, in the middle of the summer, their fire suppression system started leaking. Um, and we almost had a major flood in the building. Um, thankfully, their fire department um, was smart to turn off the water. And I had to go to the town in the middle of the summer to ask for money. Um, they don't have the reserves that Deerfield has to pay for emergencies. Um, so we were able to get the last of their ARPA money, um, their last call for ARPA we took to repair um, leaking pipes in their building. It's a dry system, I won't get into detail, so it wasn't leaking yet, but it, as soon as it fills with water, it does. So anyway, so going back to Deerfield. I mean, I can answer questions on anything, but... Um, Front entryway, you know, let's do that one last. Any questions on the mini splits? I think we're done with phase three. What's that? I think we're done. We're completed. Right. Oh, did I you say said two phase three? two. Right. Oh, uh, right. Two. Um, we, we did two and We three. folded money back in to yes. complete it. We took the rebate money, they folded it back in, um, and so now. But the major rooms have not been. So, you know, the cafeteria and the, the gym are not, you know, but um, that's a cost that we. Mm -hmm. Right now. 
I was about to ask, is that on the horizon, the wish list item? It's, it, I think it might be on the wish list thing, but the, the numbers are, um, you know, half a million. I mean, like, it's just, it goes to, it goes Which up to, huge. because of what this type of system you have to put in, you have to put a rooftop unit in, mm -hmm. you don't have a flat roof, you know, how are you going to get, you know, that, so there's a lot of challenges on that, and we're going to have greater needs. If it gets hot enough, we can get kids comfortably in the classroom. Um, the building itself, with this much AC happening in it, you open doors up, and you, know, you can right. get some general cooling happening. So, you know, maybe phys ed takes the day off, we have that kind of heat. Um, or the after school program, I think. I think yeah. that a lot. I feel like I pick my kids up and they're like bright red. And red. Yeah. They, they also do. don't stop. So I was going to say, they and, break. and they do have like the music room that they go to and they can cool off. Yeah. Um, but again, when, so um, for capital for next year, kind of my timeline is um, getting kind of things kicked off this year. Right now, uh, meetings are set to start looking at capital projects for next year. Tina will be meeting with Bill Hildreth to kind of go through what are operational demands, and then he's going to talk about building demands, um, and then I'll be bringing that to you next month and kind of go through, here's the list, here are what we think the administrative priorities are, here are the costs, and then we start to figure out what we want to go um, to the town with, what are we going to pay for, you know, what might be small enough that we can pay for either end of year reserve, end of year um, reserves or school choice is getting a little bit less that we can use, um, but that will be happening next month, so you know, we don't stop, so to speak. Um, the phone system is, again, it was, it was much needed, um, working great, right, Tina? Yeah. I saw you on it. This was your phone. He saw me on it. Yeah. I'm making a phone call to somebody. They're really impressive, so <clears throat> it takes a little bit to figure out how to work them. <laughs> We're good. Um, the side entrance upgrade, um, they are coming back to fix the uh, uh, handicap ramps on the on the on the end, so that they, right now it, it just drops off, mm. so someone would have to go in the grass to get out. Um, so they're coming back to fix that. Um, and video surveillance again. Um, now you're totally covered, and yeah. and so forth. So um, we just had blind spots. We didn't talk about probably in a meeting because I didn't want to, but we had blind spots on playgrounds where people, adults could approach the building, or people could approach the building. We would be able to see them or that kind of stuff. So now, you know, we're protecting our asset and our kids better. Um, <laughs> I say asset because it's our security system. You know what I mean? Like we know who's coming and going. If something was to break in or vandals and mm. was to occur, you deal with that. And the ongoing the classroom flooring to get out carpet to replace with removable carpet, so if we have spills and whatnot, um, or just any of those kind of things, is not good. All right, I went through it twice. All right, so let's talk about the front entryway. Um, we're happy that we're at the, the, you know, they still have a punch list of things to do. I have to meet with them to go over it. Um, it did not go, um, it did not go smooth, to say nicely, I guess. Um, it ended up costing more than I think originally we, at least I wanted to spend. Um, Um, so, so basically, just kind of reminding everybody why we bid, the bid went out in February, and we awarded it in April, um, and the cost estimate was going to be around one hundred eighty-five thousand dollars. And the breakdown, um, of the base that was the estimate. The bid came in a much higher, um, as you can see here. The base bid was at two fifty-four and a total base bid of 281 when you put in engineering in the bid administration. So that's where we were walking into this. All right, early on, it, it became clear as we did the general walkthrough with the companies as they were looking at the bid, and we put it as an adult, was that, that the turnaround for the buses, that they were gonna have to cut into that asphalt to reset the, the granite um, curbs, and then you were gonna have new asphalt for a foot and a half, and then you're gonna have all that crummy asphalt that was deteriorating, that was puddling. There were huge puddles in the handicapped parking spots, so they were getting out into puddles. So they said, you know, we'll add it as an adult to the bid, um, and then we will go in and, and get more money for that. Um, so that was that. We then had a change order um, as they dug up 
dug the holes out. It appears that those, you know, those little light bollards, we'll call it. The, they used to be on both sides, but apparently at some point we buried them. Um, there was no record of that, so they came upon them, so we had to get electricians out, and um, they had to pull them out and that kind of thing and make sure it was all kind of capped off appropriately and that kind of stuff. We also added um, 30 feet of curbing, so it went around the, um, so it was more complete in that area. Um, and then um, the drainage in the turnaround were these thin drains. They were all backed up and they hadn't been maintained. So your drainage, you know, all those drain bins usually are sucked out, but these were thin ones, so the town either didn't do it or didn't have the equipment to do it. And through the years, they became ignored, and that's probably why we had a lot of puddling. Um, and so, they, you know, the, this, this, many times it happens with the contractors, like, you're gonna have water you know, build up here. So we put in two drains, and we had to change the piping in order to get to those drains in the parking lot area. So you still have the rain garden that's gonna collect and slow the, the, the pattern of water going to, it all goes out to Bloody Brook. Um, it's gonna slow that, that stream during storms and such. If it reaches a maximum point, it's gonna hit the drain and go out. Um, but you still have in your driveway, that water's gotta go somewhere. And so they, they're putting, they put two new drains in and hopefully that will um, drain nicely. Um, and so those were the change order um, subalternates. Um, which ended up getting the project up to a total of $340,000. I did go to um, the town, um, so we'll talk about the funding of that. We started with that MVP grant for $114,000 um, and change. That did not cover the, anything, anything that's black. So, and, so basically that covered the rain gardens um, and, and the piping going out of that to a degree. Um, the town warrant gave us $80,000. We were required to match the grant at $37,000. And then we, the school added um, another $50,000. Um, does it have, okay, this is, and so we ended up going back to the town for $35,000. That went, I don't remember when I went in June, and went to the select board and asked for additional money. And Shelly, if I'm saying this wrong, jump in. I'm going off memory right here, I didn't write down. Um, but I went back to the town desk for another $35,000. The select board found that for us so that we could finish that loop um, because you know they were talking about whether or not they're gonna get chapter 90 money because could they consider it a roadway or not. Hmm. I don't know how they got the money, to be honest with you, if they end up using chapter 90 or not, but um, you know they, they, they gave us that money as well. So in the end, this is where the funding came from. Basically, you can call it a third each um, and ended up being more expensive than we had originally planned. I think we have a better product in the sense of drop-off that wasn't included. Um, maybe we should have saw that earlier as part of the thing. Um, the, we, we were, you know, where I said things weren't smooth. Um, the contractor started late, in my opinion. You know, he had a deadline to get it done by the school start, and he started mid-July. Um, and so that was a big factor into why we're doing a grand opening on Friday on it. Um, there were a lot of other arguments happening as well with the contractor that I can't, I'm not sure in a public meeting right now because we're still um, sorting those details out. But if we have to eventually, if we have to go to an executive session and discuss that kind of thing, we'd love to do that. So, there you go, questions? Can you, I mean, I think this is more just for like people who aren't aware of like the bid process and how that works and how a uh, that this particular company was selected? Do you think you so this know? wasn't actually the lowest bid, it was the second lowest. The lowest bid um, failed to provide adequate, I think they misunderstood because they were way low. They were, mm. I'm going off of memory, but 50,000 low, 70,000 low, I forget. whatever it was, it was like, whoa, what did you, and based on our communication with them, they misunderstood the details of the project. Um, so we let them off the bid and you go to next in line. So uh, they were the low bid, um, yeah. that kind of thing. They did do a previous project with us. They did the playground in Sunderland and did um, a decent enough job there. So um, flagged up some of the concerns that we had during the project were not found um, during that initial. Thanks. Thanks. Other questions? Well, I just have to say, it, the school looks totally different. Like, it, it 
made a huge impact and like I, I feel like the kids know where to go they like line up and it it it's so much more welcoming yes. so I do believe that that was money well spent and I'm yeah. glad that you know we've talked about it a couple of years maybe like it was mm -hmm. you know I'm glad that we waited to do it the right way yeah I mean it, it, it is pretty it's the it's one of those like you get to the final and you're like oh. You know, I'm happy it's here, but it was, it was a long trip to get there for basically what I thought was a straightforward project. Um, there was some postings online, and I want to answer to that, but the bushes we pulled out were evasive bushes in Massachusetts and technically should not have been planted. So they were on those, the evasive plant list, so if people were like, oh, we like those bushes, I remember them in it, you know, they were the burning bushes and the berry bushes that are not supposed to be planted. You can't even buy them anymore because mm -hmm. birds get them and they poop them and then they go everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and there were pricker bushes outside of an elementary school with berries. <laughs> um, so, you know, you know, you know, hindsight is easy in our scenes on that kind of thing, right? They probably were beautiful at the time. And, although the burning bushes are beautiful at this time of year. But, the new rain garden looks great. I love all the plantings. Yeah. And I love the wide uh, granite benches around. Yeah. Yeah. We are going to have to look at how we maintain them. Um, and that might be a budget thing. Um, you know, there was talk about students doing some of it, but realistically, we're gonna have to pay for major cleanouts, you know, at the end of fall season and maybe sometime mid spring to make sure to keep it working the way it's supposed to work and not get filled up. Um, the same thing with the one that you saw the fence was part of the project as well. Um, you know, so in cleaning up that garden, it kind of turned into an overgrown garden as well. So um, we don't currently budget for outside maintenance like that. It was good to see the pivot, you know, all things considered with the project itself, the administrative pivot, the communication was really strong. So that was, I think that it, it came on your team really fast. We were talking a few weeks yes. before yes. the school started and you were starting to lose hope. Um, and so- That it was gonna be good, so, to open it. That we were gonna open on time and yeah. that wasn't the case, but uh, everyone had smiles on, there was a plan. Uh, if there was confusion, there was someone nearby. There, I think that was the best part, there was, there was always a staff member nearby to assist with parents, families, whomever. And um, all things considered, I think that that's a, a silver lining, and, and, and so thank you for, for that. It, it, to extend that, hats off to the staff who did yeah, they were us, amazing. And they did great with it. And I, you, know, I, you know, we did kind of say, that, you know, if there was complaints, it's like, this was not a major problem. I mean, we could have real major problems, like going into a different door and having to work through all that. Um, it certainly took a lot of effort, but um, as I was saying, you know, it was certainly doable. You know, get yeah, the issues. community in general was fabulous with it too. There was minimal complaints, and um, staff really stepped up. Yeah, you see them all out front. It was like a responsive classroom at our entry. <laughs> like everybody was out there, you know, all hands on deck. Yeah, you could tell there's a lot of people helping, but it, I, I felt that the first couple days drop off went really smooth, all things considered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did say to Darius, ah, if we have to keep doing this for a little while, we can still do it. We got it down now. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, you don't have to. Yes. <laughs> and it goes much smoother when the front door is open. <laughs> Thanks for Thank managing you. it all summer. I'm sure it added a little bit of stress mm -hmm. you didn't plan on. Okay. Um, Keep going? Yeah. All right, handbooks. Um, so I sent you all a copy of it. So that was a PDF version that um, was shared with the, 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 the changes in it. We've since taken that version. There's another version after that that edit. There, there are some edits that like some name changes and that kind of stuff as we went through. But it was highlighted. It was the easiest one to share with you because it highlighted all the major changes. When you go to the handbook online, everything's hyperlinked, and if you go to the table of contents, you just click on it, and it takes you exactly where you're going. So if you first look at it, you're like, whoa, this got really overwhelming um, for a handbook. But uh, when people go to the handbook, they're looking for usually for something specific, um, and you know you can click and quickly go through the handbook that way if you, if you look at it online. Um, handbooks are approved by school committee, so I need you to vote on it this evening. Um, we are trying to, part of the goal of the handbook is to streamline the four elementary schools to have the same basic handbook for families. While you have to have different things for you know, drop off and after school, because each school is set up differently that way, we're trying to streamline that, you know, 
our values and our, how we're doing things within those values within our educational system are consistent around all the schools and there shouldn't be four separate handbooks. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of been slowly going that way and um, Tina had to take a big, she put a ton of work into the last handbook and when I said I was taking it and pulling it all into one, she had to give up a lot of that big work. So um, thank you for growth I, mindset. I happily <laughs> handed it over. <laughs> but each principal is having to do the updates themselves and I have to send out like, here's the legal, if there's a legal thing, this has to be updated. This, you know, So having it all in one place is. Um, so we're gonna see how it goes. Um, we'll, we'll take feedback as we get it. It is kind of, um, that timeline was, I guess one of my administrative weaknesses, I think things will take faster than they actually do. I was hoping to get that done by mid-July and ended up getting done the week prior to school starting um, between vacations of everybody taking and going back and forth. So, um, you know, we got that up kind of the last, at the last moment, so to speak. So we are going to be going through if there's either minor edits. And then we're going to try to streamline it even more. Um, I didn't have a chance to be able to come back with the full draft. Principals reviewed it, but as a group to kind of say like, okay, you know, I can give in on this and change. It doesn't have to be that way in the handbook, that kind of thing. So hopefully it, uh, it meets some of those needs and you can see when you go through um, some really positive language changes around um, you know, how, we, how we talk about our handbook, how we talk about the community and so forth. So. All right, so you are looking for a vote? Yep. Would anyone like to make a motion? Is it a Deerfield Elementary? What's the title of it? What are we approving? It? The, or, or is it a? It's, a it's the Frontier Union 38 Handbook. Yes, I guess I would say call the Frontier Union 38 Handbook. Okay. Um, to approve the Frontier Union 38 Handbook. Because it has section 24-25 school year. And, and it, just to uh, clarify and question, uh, the, the PDF that was sent out and had the highlighted items, any of the highlighted categories, those had were changes to Correct. the content. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. And, then so, I, and I second that motion. Any further questions or discussion on that? Okay. All right. All in favor of approving the handbook? Okay. Approved 5 0. Okay. And Dr. Darius for some policy updates. Oh, I, I get Tina something to do. Um, <laughs> so you have two sections. I'll do all the policies at once if you don't mind. Um, you have two of them. And as, as you know, we try to, even though um, this has very little effect on the elementary school, the first one is IHBG, and you have the changes in red. Basically, um, our old homeschooling policy has that a student with approval of school committee may be, may be awarded a high school diploma if she sort of satisfies, you know, um, um, satisfies Department of Secondary Education's com um, competency requirements as met the district's educational standard for graduation. That hasn't happened a lot, but um, that and they're able to uh, participate in after school activities, ex extracurricular um, and curricular upon approval of the superintendent. Um, in, in more we see it more at Frontier as you have athletics, drama program, and that kind of thing. But um, I, I, as the person who has to make a decision on this, if it comes to, I think um, it really shouldn't be allowed. I think we held our students to an expectation at a school, and if their educational requirements are not the same as the other people who are participating, who have to meet certain requirements in order to participate, from um, behaviorally to, um, you know, from behavior and character in the building to um, academic standards. While homeschoolers, families do give me um, reports to go through, it's very little detail as to what their academic standards are um, overall. It's just, it's an area of coverage. It's a very small thing. The law really gives the families full, free leeway to do what they want as long as they hit the major kind of components. Um, and so how does it affect the elementary school? Very little. Um, in fact, the one thing I brought up was it doesn't affect um, like recreation sports, that's the town rec department, um, you know, those kind of things that's not associated with the school. So it may have little to no effect here, um, but we try to keep all our policies the same and talking about it as well. So, so anyways, it's first read so we can think things over. Um, 
And if you have questions, comments, or concerns, send them to me. The next set of, um, of uh, policies, sorry, I started to talk too much, um, is really um, has to do with the change of Title IX. And so this is language that went to MASC, who usually hands us the policies, and then it went to um, your law offices, uh, Dupree Law Offices, offices who's your attorney. They modified them to a couple minor details. If you kind of go through, you have to really look for the changes. But since they represent us in these type of things, um, they had suggestions as well. So this is their version. Um, obviously, it's marked throughout where the changes are, but you know, for the camera, it's you know, non-discrimination on the basis of sex, um, non-discrimination on the basis of gender identity, which I'll come back to, because that one's a little different. Um, sex and sex-based harassment and retaliation. Non-discrimination on the basis of sex under Title IX, including sex-based harassment. Non-discriminating policy, including harassment and retaliation. And so these are basically the laws, um, the Title IX being reinterpreted into our policy. If you have heavy questions on this, try to get to me before meetings. I probably, if it's a heavy question, I probably have to talk to the attorney about why certain things are certain ways within it. Um, but as you kind of read through it, you can kind of get the, the gist of how things were changed. Um, I also just want to announce that the, also with the new Title IX changes, I brought our attorney in over the summer and met with our administrative staff um, to go through the Title IX changes and such. Um, and anytime we really do have a Title IX issue, we do use, use an attorney right out, of, right out of the gate to, to walk us through, because we don't have it. It doesn't happen often, and it is a very confusing law. I do want to come back to ACAA. This one's a little bit different, um, because this one we created. Our um, anti-racism and equity group last spring um, took on this project um, because the policy um, that read prior, you know, basically stated that we did not discriminate on the basis of gender and gender identity, but it didn't go through and really explain, and the committee felt that it was really, um, it didn't feel welcoming for students, um, you know, students you know, with their own gender, gender identity or um, you know, students who may be between gender identities or um, you know, fluid in that area. So if you read through it, you can see the language is really you can see what we're saying. It's not just legal language. It says, we see you, um, you're respected in our community, and we're here supporting you. So if you read through that, that's what, it, that's what you know, the intent of it was. As you can see, it's ACAA. So whenever you have an additional initial, it's an extension of another policy. So it goes to ACA, and then this continues on there. So um, we also sent it to our LGBTQ plus club in, um, at Frontier and had them review it. Um, and so we had student input on that. That student input was included, um, and then some of their input was not directly, it wasn't policy related, it was just some other ideas around that that was great to get feedback from them. So um, it was, we were it was happy to get their, their thoughts on it as well. So um, again, that is also a first read. Oh, okay. So, in, so you keep an, do you keep an, how do people actually? I understand it says director of student services or Title IX coordinator, like will contact Title IX coordinator. How do people find out who the Title IX coordinator is? So if you went to our website, you can get it would be Title listed. IX. If you want to file a report, there's now a button there that you can okay. file, um, file, um, uh, can file straight from there, and then each one has all the listings of who the Title IX coordinator and who to contact if you have concerns. Okay. Yep. Right. So they're not just leaving a random message. Yeah, the public would <laughs> never... This is our policy. The public would never go to our, I'm never use the word never, right? Wouldn't be going to our policy to file a Title IX report. They would go, you would go to our website, it would, even in our handbook is hyperlinked to the same mm -hmm. place. It's all kind of thing if you had, you know, if something would happen to you or you have a complaint to make. Um, you know, this is really, our policies are buried. I mean, you have to go yeah. into school command or policies and then yeah. it's like 17 clicks this way. This is, you know, I think it's two, I try, we try to make it two or three yeah, clicks away so you can find it easily, and it's in multiple places. Good. Well, I'm happy about the process to create this policy, the, the A&E committee, and then getting students input. Yeah, and, you know, hats off the a &E committee that, um, in the sense of, it, it's, a lot, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's mm -hmm. um, um, getting it done. Yeah, I appreciate that.
Any other questions or comments on the first read? Terry, sorry, right again. You already keep going. <laughs> Presentation on the design. Uh, keep talking. I did not yeah. think like I didn't think properly through this when I. Then after um, that, you have your report. I just thought you'd be prepared. Small, <laughs> a small video or something. Um, <laughs> snack break. Help <laughs> yourself. So, all right. So this time of year. Um, I usually start talking about strategic plan because we use our strategic plan to build our school improvement plans. Um, the strategic plan that we, we have, we could continue to add to it as we have been. It's, I think it's a solid plan and it has good direction in it. Um, it was built when I did my um, original uh, onboarding. They have you do an entry plan and then you build your strategic plan from the superintendent's entry plan. So I, I did that seven years ago. Um, and then I was in where we were in year two or three of that and then COVID hit and we kind of put the plan on hold because we weren't really making, we were, you know, we were fighting fires rather than um, you know, preparing. So we're at a point now where it's time to take a good look at our strategic plan and we want to do um, a year of outreach to get information from teachers, from the community, parents um, about goals of the school identifying what a student portrait looks like, what a graduate portrait looks like, meaning like what do we want our students to look like, um, not look like, but what they, what do they, who will they be after they go through our system, and what are we trying to achieve. Um, so the timeline I have for this, and this is kind of, uh, not kind of, I gotta go to the page. Um, by the end of the month, I'll communicate this out. Um, and by mid-October, we will distribute a strategic plan survey to families and staff, um, really asking for their input on not only how things are going and their perceptions of things, but things they like to see. Um, followed by that, we will do coffee and conversations um, and um, at each elementary school and frontier, and then it was mentioned at the last meeting, it's already been updated. Um, we're gonna do a virtual evening meeting as well um, to get input from people um, as well. We're gonna take that input with the, uh, take that input with the surveys and we're gonna create this portrait of student success um, from that data. And then from that, we'll provide an update to the school community where we're at. Um, they, the writing team is gonna create the first draft of the strategic plan. Some parts of the strategic plan aren't new. Like where we are going curriculum right now, we have a plan, um, maybe we'll, we'll add to it and alter it, but there's some um, pillars within that. There's, it's just, you know, it's solid where a PD direction is going and that kind of stuff. Maybe we'll, you know, dress it up a little bit with some things, but um, I'm just very interested to see what, you know, what feedback we get there. The right team will create a plan. We'll do a SWOT analysis in early spring. Um, if you have a SWOT analysis, just a formal way of looking at strength and weakness and opportunities and threats. Um, within a plan, we're going to send it back to school councils to look at and teacher groups to look at, and then we'll bring it back to the school committee um, to share, kind of get feedback on. That'll be at the joint meeting, timing wise. Um, and then if it's ready to go, it'll be ready to go for the following school year. If it goes back for more revisions, we, we'll see where we're at. Um, this feedback is also, you know, it's the way I was looking at it. If you look at strategic plans and how they're done in many districts throughout the state, um, it's, it's there's a full range. Sometimes they hire consultants to do it. Um, they pay a lot of money for someone to come in and, and, and uh, uh, you know, kind of set up how to do it and that kind of thing. Basically, it's about getting feedback from the community and taking the feedback and your own data and, and find, putting it through. I wanted to create something that is, I mean, there's three people running this. It's Sarah, Mitchell, you know, Laura Ramsey, and myself. Um, something that's manageable but also gets the goals of trying to get feedback and that kind of thing. And so um, that's kind of where, where the kind of the goal is there. The administrative team also calls the principals. So we met during the summer, at one of our, we call it a retreat, but it's in a room in a school, so I don't know what we call it a retreat. Um, but we talked about our current strategic plan and you, we just felt like it was need to, to get an injection of life and nobody really knows what's in it. And so this is kind of getting um, community feedback and that kind of stuff. So. Um, like I said, this is also, the strategic plan's a living document, so we have the, we can change it from year to year, but you want to have your courses set 
of where you're going. Um, and this plan to develop it is also a living document. Like I said, we've already changed it since the last meeting where the school committee gave um, some thoughts on how to, you know, again, the virtual night, which was a no-brainer, but we didn't have it on there um, to get people who can't attend the coffee. Room. So, yeah, that's the, the plan. Are we able to ask a question? You okay. about the, the strategic plan process because it all sounds great and I think the, the, the strategy for community uh, sort of solicitation of feedback is, is a good one the I'm just curious how our past strategic plan what the challenges were for getting some things implemented but what sort of success rate did we have with the goals that were put in there and, and so I'm just trying to kind of look at the execution of it um, sure. so so that while we're doing this planning work we can kind of in, set ourselves up for success. Right, so when you look at the strategic plan, think of it like it's the, the top plan, right? And then from in it, you're gonna have your, what's gonna fall in your equity plan, what you're doing for your equity work, your professional development plan, um, and your curriculum plan. So all those things, like we kind of mentioned, like when we went back into the equity audit, that was in our strategic plan to do a dive into that. Ended up creating, and it was in there to create that. So. Challenges are, it's all about, you know, resources, time is probably the biggest thing. We have, pe we have the people and that kind of thing, but it's the time and um, interruptions where something else becomes a bigger, bigger need. And so, you know, you know, priorities jump with the strategic plan. We made pretty good progress, and I can share with you um, last year's strategic plan. Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's a public document, obviously. Um, and I'll do that so you can kind of go through and see what I'm talking about. But we basically have what we're working on, how we're going to do it, and what the expected timeline of getting it done and who's responsible for it. Um, and so when you see through it, you'll get an idea that, like, it, it's, I think it's, it was a solid plan and it moved us, um, but it didn't have the public input into it. It was created by me in a vacuum, and then, and then principals kind of added to it. And then, um, but then we modified it out of COVID. We kind of came up with our kind of our own emergency relief mm. plan of our own plan to kind of um, get people back on board uh, or the kids back and going, so. And part of the process, we do assess like where we are with um, all of the goals in there. We did that over the summer and um, check to see like, do we need to keep that still on there or are we making good progress or are we done with that? So it's not like we didn't complete it or we didn't meet any of our goals. They're kind of ongoing. Does that make sense? No, it makes yeah. complete sense. It's, it's one of those things where you, you want to thread the needle of having that big picture, but it has to be manageable yes. to your point and not just a document that's pie in the sky sitting on a desk yeah. somewhere. Yes. And so it's uh, as many, as many um, ways that we can kind of trickle it into existing communication channels and, and the hierarchy of, of uh, command, then that way it just gets pushed out at every, every kind of... Um, 100% yeah. agree. And yes. we, did a, we did a lot of reverse design on that. So you could have something coming, like we're working on our, in our ILT meeting, this came out as a plan. Then it kind of moved up to like, we're gonna put that in our student school improvement plan. I'm like, well, you might as well bring it all the way up and have that added. Yeah. So, yeah. because it, then that's just kind of naturally how some of those things are. And we're a small enough district, you know, we're a district with like 12 schools. Like you have to be very clear, but you know, we're a very tight district that, and because we're smaller, we can change things from year to year. You know what I mean? And, you also have to be careful. You don't change things too much. Everybody thinks you're just bouncing around. So you want to have some kind of stable. But um, but we definitely done a lot of reverse design on stuff. Right? Yeah. Just one more note on the portrait of a graduate. The the Springfield Public Schools did this model, and they have a good website with a lot of um, pre-made content that might be worthwhile um, looking at. Um, a lot of I know it's a completely different school district, but the goals are essentially the same. You know, what is what is the vision for our students when they when they leave our school system? And so, um, just some good food for thought there. Yeah, you know, definitely. And the idea of the portrait of a graduate, the portrait of a, you know, we want to use portrait of a student for elementary because the portrait of a graduate, because portrait of a graduate might be a little bit too too distant in people's minds, um, but. It's, it's all, it's, the, it's what's going on across the state. I've been to a, a preschool graduation here. Yeah, that's right, you yeah. so there you go. You're like, I'm done. <laughs> Success, yep. graduated. It's a different portrait. <laughs> I think it's your party popsicles. You're really like, still looking for that first rent check. <laughs> all right, thank you. Uh, is there another question? Uh, 
Okay. <laughs> I was going to give a tiny break. I okay, I'm going to take one sentence. <laughs> uh, we'll move on. To, there's another question on that. We'll move on to reports. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who came for the professional development session um, slash learning, uh, sharing knowledge. Uh, I thought it was really well attended. Um, I hope it was helpful to people. And if anyone has uh, feedback on things they would like to see included if we do this again in the future, I'm all ears. That's all I have. Um, collaborative report. I understand there has not been any meeting. Collaborative has not met yet. Okay. So the report is the first meeting is next week. Great. That's an easy report. <laughs> and back to you, Barry. <laughs> the good news is I basically went through everything and, and I put those hyperlinks of this stuff that I showed tonight in my report. Um, I did want to mention, as I mentioned to the other school meetings, that ballot question number two, um, just so that you are aware of it, is to um, eliminate MCAS as a graduation requirement. Um, you know, it came through my association to make sure to get the word out that there's a lot of confusion out there about it, that it's eliminating MCAS. MCAS is not being eliminated. The state, it's just so you know this as school leaders, if you don't already know, you know, MCAS is a federal requirement that we need to receive federal funds that you have an assessment of students. Um, what they're trying to do with this ballot question is to remove it as a graduation requirement. So it, it will be whether or not it passes or if, it, if they remove it as a graduation requirement, your students in this district will still be taking the MCAS right. in, for years to come. To overcome, if they're going to change MCAS and how it, it's being done, there's a lot of talk, even from I guess from all professional associations, to make it better. Um, that, that's certainly out there. But I just want to make sure people understood that because if you start having conversations like, "Yeah, MCAS stinks," I, I mean, we don't want to. You know, the kids shouldn't have to do that. The kids are still going to have to do that. It's just not going to be a graduation requirement, um, and it has not been a. If you look at the statistics, it, it's about 700 students in the state a year who don't pass the, do not pass it in order to graduate. They may fail their sophomore year, but the school then works on um, working with the student to, to make up the tests and you know, portfolios and that kind of thing to get them through. Um, in my 17 years at Frontier, there's only been one student who's not made it through, um, and there were outstanding circumstances attached to that that was not the within the school's uh, ability to help. So. Just kind of saying that out there it doesn't really affect our district much, but because someone will say, "Well, does it stop people from you know graduating your district?" No, it, we we're able to get we have a pretty solid program, and we get the kids through. It also has to do with demographics as well, but, and attendance and that kind of thing. <clears throat> has Dusty decided not to move forward with social studies? What's that? With the MCAS, the social studies MCAS. Yeah. The, the, Did they vote on that? Yeah, okay. I think they did, okay. yeah. That's it for me. All right. Any other comments? No one has anything else to add. Oh, I would just like to say thank you for these. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if no one has anything else, I would be looking for a motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Meeting adjourned at uh, four, 604.